Hello and welcome to episode 6 for our Let's Play of The Two Towers. In the last episode, we were with Frodo, Sam, and Gollum as they started exploring in Athelion, and we came across uh, Boromir's brother, Faramir, and his uh, group of rangers who have joined our party for the time being. And we just left their uh, secret uh, cave. So uh, we can continue to explore uh, Athelion. So the first thing we're going to do is just head to the northeast from uh, where we left the cave, and uh, you'll find this other part of the river up here, and uh, there's some athelis here on the cliff overlooking it. So we'll want to grab those, because we'll need them in a minute. And uh, we'll want to follow along the southern bank of the river here. Past the bridge. We should find some place to fish along here. We can come back to that. Um, so the path south of the bridge, I just want to come just uh, to the west of that. And it looks like we ran into one of the south runs again, uh, paragraph 142. Stretched like a rack of clothing on the ground lies a living warrior of Harrod, a south run. He wears a tattered scarlet robe and a corselet of overlapping brazen plates. His back plates of hair are braided with gold. His dark eyes turn toward you, pleading. He is not wounded, by the shade of his skin once swarthy but now as tawny as the heated sands of his home, you see he is ill, or poisoned, maybe. You wonder what the man's name is, and if he is really evil at heart, or what lies or threats have led him on the long march from his home, and if he would not really rather have stayed there in one piece, all in a flash of thought. The warrior tries to speak, but he cannot. You could slay him with a blow. He is, after all, a servant of the enemy. Do you attack the Southron? Well, we'll choose not to attack him. Because we can actually use the Athlas we just found to uh, cure him of his uh, illness. Color begins to return to the warrior's face. He thanks you for saving his life and marvels at your healing skills. So now we can talk to him. What was his name? Her Herkinus, I guess is how you would say that. The orcs poisoned the plants in this region as a trap. Avoid them or face the peril that befell me. And you can't ask him too much, like you can ask him about the orcs. Uh, they crawl the great river city to the south and the caves to the east. These offer only danger. But the big reason we did that was so that we could recruit him. And he'll join your party. So now we want to come back to the uh, part where the river splits here and go to the northern bank by the cliff. Here the stream drops briskly into the earth, beneath an arch of rock like a cave mouth. You hear echoes of the current from deep within, but there seems no way down, unless by jumping into the waters. And you can climb here. The cold water engulfs you and pulls you downward, into the gloom. Swept hard and fast, you cannot trace your passage, but you wash safely ashore on a beach of gravel. And there's a little- we're in a cave now, and there's a little part you can explore to the north, but there's nothing there except uh, an enemy to fight. So we'll start by jumping across this chasm here, to the other side. The darkness brings a chill breeze and the sound of gentle currents, muted to softness in the gloom. You cannot proceed without light. Well, I guess I uh, tried to walk forward and it brought me back outside. So we'll just go back down into the cave. And what you'll need to do, I guess, is, I think you can use your torch, but what I'm going to do so no one has to equip it is use the file that Galadriel gave to Frodo, and that should light up the cave. The warrior's finger bones point upwards to a message scrawled in a drift of dirt amid the living rock. Mulip. Before you lie the bones of a man, clad in mail, with a notched and rusted sword beside him. And you can grab the warrior, I mean the, the chain mail from the warrior. Or one of your uh, one of your rangers, if you want to. No, not discard. We'll want to equip it. Farmer already has a chain armor. I would have given it to him. In the depths of darkness behind the sarcophagus, you notice still deeper darkness. A hole, no more than a hobbit height. It is blocked by a pile of stones beyond. Cool air touches you like a brush of chill fingertips. The hole is blocked with rubble. You cannot pass through. I think you can use the shovel. It's either the shovel or the pry bar, or maybe both. But you can also use uh, Galadriel's box for some reason. A grain of dust from Galadriel's box softens the rubble and allows you to pass through safely. You expected the tunnel to collapse behind you, but it doesn't. 
darkness brings a chill breeze and the sound of gentle currents, muted softness in the gloom. You cannot proceed without light. You'll just do the same thing again. Use the file. And paragraph number 39. Before you lift your light, you feel at once that this must be a tomb. The dusty air is stifling, but not foul. Now and then you feel a draft of cool air issuing from unguessed openings in the walls. The sounds of your footsteps echo hollowly. No gleam comes from your elven blade. Square stone pillars in a line reach back into darkness. The first bears a bronze plaque. Written in Fenorian characters is the name Teladring, and beneath it, in an antique mode of the common speech, I here lie in glory, heroine, magister, last of his line with his beloved ancestors, until the west rise again. Mardahir, stoneworker, he carves the hall in the fourth year of Belagorn Regent Stuart. Along the wall to the north and south lie coffins, sarcophagi, superbly carved in black stone. To the north are men, finely dressed, to the south, women in flowing gowns, but they are all defiled, their lids thrown askew, bones piled at the pedestal's base. A tangled pile of bones lies under a heavy coat of dust. Some evil hand has violated the crypt. This was once a man, if the cover of the, if the, cover of the sarcophagus tells true. And I'll say that to all the tombs you come across on the top, except this second one here. Among the bones, as out of place as a king's crown in a pantry, sits a bracelet of bright silver marked with delicate figures. The bracelet is, Numenor is Numenorian work, or work of Gondor after Numenor fell. But this was woman's jewelry in those times, and these bones bear, and these bones lie near a man's tomb. So you can take that bracelet, and if you go to that uh, coffin, to the east wall. Pull out paragraph 204. As you step upon a slab of marble of lighter color than the rest, an air of watchfulness rouse, and a voice sounds in your minds. Greetings to you who wish well in my remembrance. I was hero and magister, named for the great ruling steward, born in the first year of his reign, in the glory of Gondor and the watchful peace. I dispense justice in matters great and small, from Minas Tirith to aged Osgiliath. My name is known throughout the townships of Athelion. I built this tomb, the largest and fairest of any magistrate, to memorialize my great career and ancestors. Consider my works, visitor, and learn from them. You plunder my tomb, the voice cries in your mind. For that, I blight you with the justice of great Gondor. Burglars, as your honor has waned, so shall you. Set the bracelet upon its lady's tomb, or still worse, shall befall you. Well, said that the lady's tombs were along the uh, southern part of the wall, and you get the same description. If you go to these as the northern ones, the only difference is that it says there are women. So we come to this third one. The sarcophagus bears the image of a bracelet and some kind of end of the kind some women in Numenor and Gondor wore. Tokens of spiritual peace. The coffin feels cold as death to your touch. And when you find the proper one, you want to get rid of the bracelet here. As you place the bracelet gently atop the bones, a warmth as of sun on the open sea pervades the sarcophagus. The air here grows fresh and sweet like spring. So we can go back. And we get the same 204 paragraph. You restore the balance in my resting place, the voice says warmly. Take this token of protection that you may earn the justice your honor deserves. I'll just give, uh, you get a shield, so I'll just give it to Frodo. and we'll keep going to the east. White strands lie dense woven across the tunnel. Spiders, their filmy, many-windowed eyes break and throw back your light. They sit silent and unmoving upon their webs as though waiting. And you can use a uh, sting, just like our uncle Bilbo did in Mirkwood Forest on these spider webs. The oven blade's bitter edge hues in a wide stroke across the ladder of close-strung cords. The blue gleaming blade cuts through them like a scythe through grass. The webs leap and writhe, and then they hang free. A single candle floats in the air, casting a sickly light on a shape not quite human. Its lean limbs shudder, its noiseless face twists, and with the flaring of its long claws, the mew lip in its lair silently attacks. It's another little thing that looks like Gollum here. And this was uh, the message we saw written by the dead soldier earlier. We'll just want to fight him real quick. The 
gray form evaporates in foul, bitter smoke as the candle gutters and fails. Nothing remains but your wounds, and maybe your fear. One of your fellowship who has had experience with the artifacts of evil warns you that the treasure of a mulip is often cursed. Faramir warns you against touching this gold. There are records of such creatures in the libraries of Minas Tirith, Faramir says. It is said that misfortune will follow one who touches such a hoard until the end of their days. You can take this uh, gold if you want, but if when you try to enter the river, it will weigh you down and you'll have to get rid of it anyways. And this is the way you have to leave, so there's really no point in taking it. And it'll let you back out the same place that Faramir's cave uh, lets you out. So we'll want to go back to that river, because there was something we needed to find along the southern bank. So we'll just find the road here and uh, go the north. See glistening shiny fish. Fishes, Gollum says, his mouth gaping. It makes you hungry just looking at him. Tender, juicy fishes. They swim, so we catches them. He looks at you for approval. Do you let him fish? And you uh, will want to say yes. Gollum coughs and spits out a bright gemstone. Nasty fishes. Tries to choke poor Smeagol with stone. We cannot swallow it, my precious. No, we can't, says. It doesn't seem very significant, but you will want to take this rock. Because we'll find out in a second. The fish had swallowed a peculiar shiny round stone. Though smooth, it seems to contain many interior facets, giving the effect that one is looking down a hall that quickly bends around a corner. The rangers are astonished. This is the stone that fits on the headpiece of the king's statue at the crossroads of Athelion. The stone has a long and great history. It should be placed again on the statue at the crossroads. So there's a little quest involving that stone, which is why we uh, will want to take it. So then we'll go back to the path and uh, head along to the south to the crossroads it was just talking about. You can actually go to the west here. Uh, and you find some orcs with a battering ram, it looks like. So we'll take them out. And there's uh, one, well, aside from the quest with the uh, stone and the statue, there's one more, one more thing we can do in Athelion before we leave. Uh, this wasn't working for, for me earlier, and it doesn't look like it's going to now. But somewhere to the south of that uh, catapult on the road, you should be able to find the the Mumek that ran away earlier, and get him. You can get him to join your party uh, if you use charisma on it, or if you have the South Run in your party. I think there will be an option for. Uh, for him to tame it for you and it'll uh, join your party but we're about to lose a lot of our party members anyways so i'm not going to spend that much more time looking for it and we have the roads to the west and south but if you go all the way to the south it'll basically i'll just uh, go ahead and go if you go to the west uh you can come across osgiliath but you can't do anything there you'll get a game over if you get too close to it because of all the orcs there South lie only the burning lands of Herod, in enemy hands and far removed from your quest. Orcs and worse patrol the roads. You cannot go that way. So our only option left is... Uh, a black shadow crosses the night sky, issuing a deadly cry. It circles relentlessly, searching for its dark master. Once again, the Nazgul fills the night with terror. Gollum cannot endure the scrutiny of the Dark Rider. He falls to the ground, quaking with fear, saying nothing, and cannot continue to travel for some time. Well, I guess uh, it wasn't a very long time because he can travel with you immediately. And we come to the east and you can grab the statue head. Along the side of the road, an old kingly statue sits. Its head has been knocked off by orcs and lies forlorn on the side of the road. So we have the statue here. 
So we'll actually need to climb up the statue first before we can do anything to it. Struggling, tenaciously gripping the handhold, you climb to the top of the statue. And now we can use the artifacts that need to be put back on it. Put the statue head on first. You've placed the head on top of the statue, a perfect fit. Yet something is missing. Farmir recounts a legend about the statue of the crossroads. In olden time, in Numenor, the elves gave the Numenorians many gifts of beauty and power. The gem that is missing, like those of the Argonath, were said to bestow a special blessing. The orcs despoiled the gem, yet I think I know where it may be. The orcs display their treasures during our battles at Osgiliath. Boromir said that he pursued an orc banner adorned with a gem of the Argonath for many leagues, northeast of Osgiliath. But the banner fell into one of the rivers that flow into Anduin and was lost. Perhaps the stone is near the river, waiting to be found. To find it would be a token of favor from the Valar, once all treasures come. And uh, we already saved time and already found the rock, so we'll use that. It is done. The king has a crown again, you say, as you look with pride at the restored glory of Gondor. May other things that reject the shadow be restored, you think. There's a rare moment of peace. And you get a little, like, uh, boost, I think, for doing that in your stats. Let me take one more uh, pass down here and... There, oh, there it is. Uh, a great Mumic of the Herod. Its war tower is now no more than splinters on its back. It appears restless, but is not about to attack. You see no servants of the enemy here. We'll go to paragraph 120. Hyrcanus waves you back, then takes a few slow steps towards the Mumic. It stops chewing and watches him with wide eyes, ready to bolt at a heartbeat's notice. But the Southron speaks soft, murmuring phrases in a language you have never heard. It does not sound like magic, but it might as well be, for the warrior comes close enough to the Mumic to lay his dusky hand upon its flank. He strokes an ear, murmuring all the while. In minutes, the Mumic calms. At the warrior's word, it moves towards you. The Grey Brother will follow us as we will, says Hyrcanus. Another victory for the mighty warrior. As they stare with wide eyes on the huge creature, no one in your party feels the urge to argue. And like I said, you can use charisma on it if you want. Take a look at it. Uh, take a look at it. There it is. It's uh, pretty tough in any of the battles that you may come across. Yeah, so I guess you need to go a little bit to the west where you go south. And then there's a statue, so we'll want to keep uh, going to the east. And uh, if anyone in your party has anything that you want for Frodo, Sam, or Gollum, you will want to trade it to them before you uh, get over here. Because I think uh, Gilglin will follow you, actually. But you're about to lose most of your party. Faramir shakes his head. By the command of the steward of Gondor, no ranger may enter Morgul Vale, save by the direct command of Denethor. It is time to say our farewells, yet hope tells me that we shall meet again. I guess Gilglin does leave you, so it's a good thing we got that stuff from him. A long tilted valley, a deep gulf of shadow, runs back far into the mountains. In the distance, resting upon the black knees of the mountains, lies Minas Morgul, the accursed city of the Witch King. Paler than moon, ailing in some slow eclipse, the light from its towers reminds you of the corpse light of the dead marshes, save that no fair thing can be found imprisoned here, unless Zildur city itself can be said to be a hostage of the enemy. The towers and the walls have openings like countless black holes leading into emptiness, but they are filled with a constant watchfulness and hate. Sauron's pitiless fortress, stolen from Gondor long ago, is utterly corrupt. We'll go back to uh, Merry and Pippin. Meanwhile, in the force of Fangorn, members of the Fellowship seek to bring word from Skinbark and Leaflock to the Entmoot. Even with the Entwash water, Leaflock barely stirs. Like a great tall pine tree, he barely sways. We already gave him the water uh, last time, so we talked to the two Ents that we need that we needed to uh, bring news from to the Entmoot. So now we can. Uh, Another ambush. We uh, already had one of those previously, so I won't read it again. We need to go back to the Entmoot. And you'll just want to go uh, all the way to the east and south. Another horn trap there. You've come across a cache of strange black acorns. They have a disquieting shape to them, but seems appropriate for some darker areas of this forest. Uh, I think we already have a couple, so I'm not going to take them. 
Um, but I think they keep the horns from attacking you if you don't have uh, any Ents in your party. And uh, if you happen to come across uh, Stiff Branch, I think was his name, he can take you to the Ent Moot. Just, uh, I think if you type in Tree Beard or Ent Moot, one of those will work. We just took the long way. Oh, uh, when you do something with this guy here and talk to Stiff Branch, I suppose that it wouldn't hurt to talk with you. I hope I'm not being too hasty. We can trade him the, uh, I think Mary has it. Nope, Pippin has it. The, uh, int draw that we've been saving to him. It is very generous of you, Stip Branch says. Perhaps I've been hasty in my judgment of you. I have some special draw that I would share with you. Do you drink it? The brew burns as it passes down your throat, but leaves you with a vigorous feeling. And that will heal you, uh, some of your guys. I think uh, raises the health of your hobbits too. So now we can go back to the Ent Moot and talk to Treebeard. We're actually getting close to the last, uh, one of the last things we'll do with Merry and Pippin, at least for a while. You come upon an area of pine trees like an amphitheater. At your arrival, the motionless Ents begin to stir. Treebeard walks up to you. Ho, oh, whom you have returned. What did Leaflock and Skinbark have to say? At last, the chorus of the Ents falls silent. A loud whom is heard, and a line of Ents begins marching out of Durdingdale. We are marching to Isengard, Treebeard says. Will you join us? The Ents begin to boom. To Isengard, to Isengard. We are off to Isengard. First time I did this part, uh, you can keep going to the south, but it'll just bring you back to this point. So what you need to do is cross this ford in the river here. Because Isengard's to the west, and you'll pretty soon come upon it. It's this big fortress here. So we'll go around to the front door. Uh, paragraph 20. The gates of Isengard fling open, and hundreds of horns blare their warnings. A thunder of hoofbeats and iron-shod boots fills the air as thousands of men and orcs spill forth from Isengard, marching off to war. It takes a while for the armies to pass, but the Ents remain still, waiting patiently for the hosts to pass. The ugly faces of the orcs, the sharpness of their weapons, and the odor that wafts from them is enough to make you want to flee, but you derive some comfort and confidence from the Ents which surround you. As the last of the army leaves, the gates close shut with a resounding boom. Well, not close enough, because you can just walk right into them. The last of Saruman's orcs, obviously not his best, grab weapons and charge to attack. They do not seem to be confident of victory. And you actually have Treebeard join you for this last uh, part. So between the three of them, you should be able to get rid of them pretty quickly. Get him in this uh, round here. Saruman's forces are beaten. The Ents finish their destruction of the engines of Isengard. Saruman cowers within the black stone walls of Isengard, not daring to appear. The Ents are pleased by their victory. They expect some special guest to be coming soon and ask that you wait in the gatehouse for them. A tall Ent named Furcombe now oversees the Watch of Isengard. So that's the last thing you uh, will do with Merry and Pippin until the very end of the game. Meanwhile, a desperate search is taking place as the Fellowship looks for help in defeating the legions of Saruman. Go back to Gandalf and them. And uh, the only building of real interest here is the Golden Hall, which will be at the end of this path if you follow it. I haven't really found any interesting in too many of the houses. Yeah, it's this one. The path doesn't even lead up to it. So we'll pull up 128. The guards, naked swords in hand, watch you ascend the last steps. As you reach the top, they turn their sword hilts to you in a token of peace. Wesseth hail, 
Fioren un umne, they chant. Hail, comers from afar. One steps forward. I am Hama, door ward of Theoden. Here I must bid you lay aside your weapons before you enter. Hama turns to Gandalf. Worm Tongue, that is, Master Grima, has told me that your staff is quite dangerous. He is, mo he is most insistent that you leave it here. Surely you have no wish to upset the noble Grima. The guards wince at the mention of his name. Well, you'll need to get rid of all the weapons that you have to be able to get uh, in. And I don't know why, but it closes out of the uh, little interface every time you get rid of one of them, which is kind of annoying. It has to be all your weapons, not just the ones you have equipped. But remember to hang on to Gandalf's uh, staff, because you will need that inside, even though he tells you you have to get rid of it. Hama asks that Gandalf leave his staff at the doors. Foolishness, Gandalf snaps. I am old. If I may not lean on a stick, I will sit here until the king is pleased to come out. Hama agrees to let him keep his staff. And we'll come into the main uh, chamber here with the throne at the end. 158. The guards push the heavy doors slowly inwards. Inside, it seems dark after the sunlight. The mighty pillared hall before you is long and wide, filled with shadows. Here and there, shafts of sunlight pierce down from high windows. The stones underfoot are of many hues and bear branching runes and intertwined devices. The pillars are richly carved, gleaming dully with gold and half-seen colors. Many tapestries adorn the walls, half-seen in the flickering light of the fire burning in the central hearth. Beyond is a dais with three steps. On it stands a great gilded chair, and in it sits a man so bent with age that he seems almost a dwarf. His white hair falls in great braids from beneath a thin gold circlet set with a single diamond. His beard flows like snow upon his knees, but his eyes burn brightly as he looks upon you. Behind the chair stands a woman clad in white. On the steps of the dais before the chair sits a wizened man with a pale face and heavy-lidded eyes. They remain still and silent as you approach. Theoden raises his head to speak. I greet you, and maybe you look for welcome, but truth tell it, but truth to tell, it is doubtful here for you, Gandalf Stormcrow, ever you herald woe. The pale man then says, you speak justly, Lord, the tidings of your son's death still echo in this hall, and now the Dark Lord stirs, why should we greet this master of ill news? And you can uh, try and talk to him. The time of the Lord of the Mark is precious, even in days as dark as these. Do not waste it. I think, uh, actually the first thing you should do is, uh, use Gandalf's staff on him. Gandalf lifts his staff. Theoden, the wizard says, hearken to me. Not all is dark. I have no words for those who despair. Yet counsel I could give, and words speak to you. Will you hear me? The black staff falls from the king's hand. He draws himself up, slowly, stiffness falling away, to stand tall and straight. His eyes are very blue as he looks out over Rohan. Then he turns to you with a slow smile. Dark have been my dreams of late, but I am awake now. I would, I would you had come sooner, ere the evil that besets us has grown so strong. It is strong beyond our reckoning, you answer, but we have a hope at which he does not guess. At that moment, Theoden asks for his sword, which Grima has in his keeping. Aemir enters, offering his blade. Wormtum trembles at this turn of events. Theoden commands him to join him in battle. Wormtongue bares his teeth, and with a hissing sound, spits on the floor and flees Aedarus. Undoubtedly, he is returning to his true master. Theoden dismisses the fleeing form. There is much to do. I will not die here like an invalid. Soon I shall lead the Rohirrim to battle at Helm's Deep. You can uh, recruit Theoden, Aemir, and Hama to your party. So we'll do that, and um, I think this will be a good place to bring this episode to a close. And uh, in the next video, we can uh, do some things here in uh, Aedarus in the Golden Hall before we set out for the battle at Helm's Deep. Um, but we'll begin doing all that in...